Everyone is so lazy. How about this? New survey shows uh, nearly 40% of millennials don't eat cereal anymore because it takes too much time to clean up. Talks about how the millennials don't get off the couch very often. They don't. It's uh, actually I wrote another piece for the Post not long ago about uh, millennials being the shut-in generation. I interviewed several who will spend whole weekends at home very proudly just binge watching Orange is the New Black. Or yeah. doing a Snapchat. Or doing a Snapchat. A, a sad face. Of themselves of binge themselves. watching. Right. And nobody wants to work anymore. Nobody wants to work these days. You That's have to, so true. I'm a god of hustle. So <laughs> but I, I think be also yeah. room, because you see everything on social media and you think oh it's just a lifestyle or oh it's like really quick and easy and you can just post something and it's not easy. Yeah it's just hard work like having a dad who was OJ Simpson's lawyer, a step parent who was an Olympic athlete, and then uh, you have a reality show for a couple years and you start a business. It's that simple. Are you saying that America is getting lazy, Andy Posner? Well, we certainly have, the work ethic certainly has changed since the pandemic began. I think you can talk to anybody that runs a business, any of those restaurant owners that you, that you just had on, uh, or just anybody, just go to their local restaurant or local grocery store, any place that employs people. And you'll find that it's very, very difficult to get particularly younger workers to come in, to get them to work the difficult shifts, to get them to work weekends, to get them to work overtime. We, we've had a real switch towards a, a dependence more on government programs and less on individual initiative. People don't want to work. We have set up interviews. People don't show. You know, we call people with applications to put applications in. They don't answer their phones. It's an issue that many restaurants are struggling with. It started back in the fall. Going from applications to interviews is a problem. And the third thing is once you offer jobs, are people coming in to actually work? So it's three steps. And we're, they're struggling in all three areas. When I was a kid, people always told me that if I didn't go to college, I would end up flipping burgers my whole life. Because shaming fast food workers was a national pastime. Give me a uh, liter of cola. A what? A liter of cola. And now they're mad that nobody wants to do the job that they taught us to be embarrassed to have, that they don't think should be making a living wage. Our next guest says the wage hike would devastate thousands of fast food restaurants in New York, including his own. David Sutz is the co-owner of Four Burger Kings in and around Westchester County. He joins us right now. David, good to have you on the program. Good morning. Thank so you. So what do you think this $15 wage, uh, minimum wage is going to do to, to your business first? Well, I'm very scared. We're also told that millennials and Gen Z demand a better work-life balance that they would rather be unemployed than unhappy at their jobs. And this, this is where the real problems arise, I think. First of all, if you're a young person today, or even an old person, the balance you should be worried about is not work life, but screen life. We're told that young people don't want to work, don't want work to interfere with their personal lives, but almost every waking hour of their personal lives are wasted staring at screens anyway. I could have more respect for the desire for work-life balance if you were going to home to be, you know, with your spouse and children, or you were um, uh, trying to leave yourself time to engage in a productive hobby like woodworking or gardening or something. But the fact is that for many of these people, the lives they're trying to protect from workplace intrusion are hardly lives at all. The world. People unwind in different ways. What's the difference if they're playing a video game or making birdhouses? The master craftsman can make three mailboxes an hour. But also you communicate with friends and family on those screens. You create art, you read books, you conduct business. But no, you're right. We should do uh, woodworking. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with woodworking. I'm just saying that people have different ways to unwind. And also, like, why don't children want to work? Why don't children work anymore? Now, I know you're interested in thinking of Candace because, I don't know, it's a form of slavery to have children work. Children should just be able to enjoy their childhood. But there is something about working that establishes a better human being. We are not creating better human beings anymore or quality human beings anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like, it just seems that everyone is so entitled to everything. Wait, who does she remind me of? In the good old days, kids as young as five could work as they please. From textile factories to iron smelts. Yippee, hooray! But today, the age-old right of children to work is under attack. People have been looking down on other people for a very long time because of what they call laziness. It's even one of the seven deadly sins.
sloth. Let's take a look at how pastors and Christian influencers approach this topic, and also let's discuss whether laziness is even a thing at all. Hey everybody, thank you so much for liking and commenting and subscribing and uh, for helping me get this on, on my wall that has the reflection of my ring light because I gotta start checking the reflections. Thank you so much. You're wonderful. I think this is going to be the start of a new series on the seven deadly sins, this one being sloth. Uh, I'm not going to do them in any particular order and uh, they may not even be in sequence, but I plan on doing, eventually, um, the seven deadly sins. Uh, so watch out for that. Um, it could just be like C. Fan Stevens when he was going to do all 50 states and then just gave up after two, but or three, uh, two. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe I'll do all of them. Who knows? Maybe I'll be lazy. Laziness is wickedness. You lazy and wicked servant. You see, we all have a kind of religious set of values which is not always realistic. Most churches will not tolerate drunkenness, quite rightly. But many churches tolerate laziness. And I believe actually God's condemnation of laziness is more severe than his condemnation of drunkenness. As an alcoholic myself, uh, a month and a half sober by the way, no big deal, I find it pretty telling that the example he uses to say how wicked laziness is, is drunkenness. When alcoholism is a disease. So he's saying it's more sinful than having a disease? It's more wicked than having a disease? Lazy men and lazy women are a curse in the family. The scriptures, they are clear that being lazy is a sin. If you're familiar with Matthew 25, Jesus gives the parable of the talents, and he gives talents to, to different servants. And what does he tell the servant who buried his, his talent? He comes to him and he says, what? You wicked and lazy servant. And they love to shame people for getting sleep. You know that thing that you need to do in order to live? I once heard a pastor preach a message he called blanket victory. <laughs> and I think it was really appropriate. Uh, the idea is you've got to get out of bed, man. you got to defeat that blanket, that wonderful, warm, nice, comfy blanket. Because a sign of laziness here, according to this verse, is that the lazy person won't get started. They will not start a task. Did you know that if you hit the snooze button for 15 minutes, just 15 minutes a day, if you snooze for just 15 minutes a day, that's 92 hours a year. That's four whole days of sleep at the end of a year. That's you not getting out of bed for four whole 24-hour days. Just hitting the snooze button once, 15 minutes. Okay, first of all, snooze buttons last for nine minutes. So how do you do 15 it's either going to be 9 minutes, or it's going to be 18 minutes because he hit it again. Or in my case, 180 minutes. And it's not like you can roll over those 15 minutes for later. You just have an extra 15 minutes of grogginess when you could be in bed wrapped in blankets. Ah, uh, I'm just a big toasty cinnamon bun. I never want to leave this bed. See, every single one of us needs to have mind over mattress. We need to remember that work is a great blessing. And if any of us are cutting corners, if any of us are being lazy, if any of us aren't rising at a reasonable time and we're rolling around in bed, turning up to work late, know this, the Bible says, all of a sudden, you will lose your job. I got a job as a manager a couple years ago at our grocery store. At first, I thought it was going to be a really sweet gig, until I started to notice a lot of toxic things about the company. Hello, Mr. Prishpreet. That's four of paper, two of coin. I know. <laughs> I think the biggest red flag was when another manager who was training me bragged about how little sleep he gets on some nights because you have to stay until all shipments are done at night, even if you start at 6 o'clock in the morning the next day. And this was a point of pride for, like, all the managers I talked to they would brag about how little sleep they could get. And it's not the only place I've worked where people were confused why I thought it was important that I and our employees had the opportunity to get a good night's sleep in between shifts. Something that's legally required. Just gonna have a little snack and then take a quick nap. Mm, that's good horse. 
I can eat this horse till the cows come home. And then, of course, once we get out of bed, we have to be a contributing member of society and get to work. Jesus slept in that boat where the, you know, I get it. Sometimes the best thing we can do is have a nap. It's the most spiritual thing we can do. Yes, and amen, and amen, and amen. But for some reason, working too hard is not one of the seven deadly sins. But its opposite is sloth, laziness not producing, not working, not adding to the value of the world and you just being a non-contributing zero. The Bible describes people who don't work as disorderly. That means they're lacking organization and they're contributing to the breakdown of society. It also means they're not behaving properly. Lazy people who don't do their part are not behaving properly and they're contributing to the breakdown of the community they're a part of. Think about it. People steal because they want something they can't afford to buy. People cheat and swindle others because they're greedy for quick and easy gain that they didn't have to work hard for. Also consider the jobs that don't get done because people refuse to do the work. Houses don't get painted because the owner is lazy, so the house slowly rots to the ground. Yards don't get mowed because the owner is lazy. We had a neighbor one time who planted his whole yard with monkey grass and let it grow tall just so he didn't have to mow it. Lazy people are a burden to those who work hard because the lazy person expects someone else to do the work for them. <laughs> like, oh, it went from it's the breakdown of society to him just being frustrated with his old neighbor. The lazy man, he sees his work as either to himself or to other men here in his physical life. But as Christians, we see our work unto who? The creator of all of this. When you, go to, when you go to work, you're not just working for your boss. You're working for the one who holds your boss's breath in his hand. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, the first hour of the day belongs to God in worship. The other hours of the day belong to God in work. I love that framework. Oh, no, thank you. Even when I was a believer, I met with God at night. I was the Jim Hopper of Christians. Flo, Flo, we've discussed this. Mornings are for coffee and contemplation. Chief, she's coffee your... and contemplation, Flo. And so there's always gonna be people who don't work hard. Like, I'm not gonna work hard, I'm just gonna sit around. Now, I got other sins in my life, uh, not working hard, I don't really get, all right? It gives me joy and purpose to work hard. First Corinthians 15 says, nothing I do, no labor I do is in vain. It's always building toward the new creation. And so I love the idea of building something together, making the world better, influencing people. Um, and so there's days when I don't get to do that, right? And the days I don't get to do that, I get depressed. I mean, yeah, good for you, that's, that's great. I've always had part of me that has to create. If I go too long without making a video or writing a play or painting a picture. It's great. I wrote a hit play and directed it. So I'm not sweating it either. Or something, yeah, some sort of creative outlet. I go a little stir crazy. We all have those things that, that help us get through the day. Why is not being like you and not having that same motivation for the same thing so wrong? And of course, it's the Christian that is hardworking and the non-Christian not so much. Brother, what are your hands doing? The hands of a Christian are going to be different than the hands of the Gentile, the hands of the world, the hands like you had that, that were part of the former manner of life, the hands held by one who possesses the new man who's been transformed. They look different, brethren. They're different. Or at least if they do work hard, it's for the wrong reasons. There are unbelievers who work hard. There are unbelievers who are diligent. There are people who haven't died to the world, who haven't been raised with Christ, and yet they're eager. They're relentless. They're disciplined. I think about a lot of men specifically who, who play sports, who are athletes. And they say, I become obsessive about the game. My life is this game. So day in and day out, I'm training for this game. It's what I'm thinking about in the summer. It's what I'm practicing for. But the unbeliever is doing this for his, for his idol. It's his false god. But he works hard for it. So how much more the work of the believer to the living God? 
You know what a great opportunity is for growth? A job you hate. You might not enjoy your job. Do you know that's why they pay you? <laughs> See, if you enjoyed it, you might be tempted to do it for free. And they might be like, hey, we're going to keep our money and you just keep showing up and doing that thing you enjoy. And it's called a hobby. But they pay you to be there because they know you don't like it. That's, that's the exchange. That's what's going on there, right? And it doesn't matter if you don't like it. Be awesome at it. There's an application for you. Whatever you do, work at it as though you're working for the Lord. I've had a lot of different jobs. Uh, some people would say that I've had all the jobs that there are. I have flipped burgers. Uh, I've flipped eggs. I filled boxes with cleaning supplies and detergents. At a factory, I made coffee and fraps. I sold CDs and records. I mowed a cemetery. I've done customer support over the phone. I've sold garbage pickup services over the phone. I'm Buttmaker. Our prices have never been lower. I ran a church day camp. I was a youth pastor. I was a waiter. I've, I've done a lot of different things. I've had jobs I've loved. I've had jobs I've hated. I've had jobs I've sucked at and jobs I was great at. But one thing I won't do is stand by as myself or my coworkers are being mistreated. It's not okay. Whether you're being paid or not, you don't have to love your job, but you do have the right to be treated as a human being at your job. I don't want to sell anything, buy anything, or process anything as a career. I don't want to sell anything bought or processed or buy anything sold or processed or process anything sold, bought or processed, or repair anything sold, bought, or processed. You know, as a career, I don't want to do that. So and if we're lifting up people who work and saying that you have to be gainfully employed in order to have value, what does that say about people who struggle to keep a job or people who are unemployed? People who follow God's principles about work, about productivity, about their finances, people who follow God's principles are generally going to be more prosperous than those who ignore God's principles. Are we saying that their poverty is their fault? Proverbs says sloth equals poverty, no money. Over and over and over again. Like I can show you 10 verses where it says that. Now, it's not always the case. People are poor for all kinds of reasons, social reasons and all, all that oftentimes. Uh, but the book of Proverbs doesn't read like a mathematical equation. It's general principles. And generally that's true. What is sloth then? It's like a settled attitude of idleness. And that's a scary word. But such people are consistently condemned throughout Scripture. So the one who works his land, the one who's diligent, he has plenty. He can provide for his household. He has plenty because he works. But the one who follows worthless pursuits, the, the lazy, the sluggard, this one is described as lacking sense. He's void of understanding. Because he thinks he's going to be okay, but he doesn't understand that he's bringing his own downfall upon himself by not working. There are so many factors that determine poverty. And when you have this mindset that laziness equals poverty, it can have the opposite effect as well. It causes people to believe that someone who struggles financially is doing so solely because they are lazy. It causes people to look down on people who are less fortunate. It doesn't matter that most rich people are born into being rich or that a lot of high paying jobs are given due to nepotism. You know, Mr. Burns, you're the richest guy I know. Way richer than Lenny. No, oh, yes, but I'd trade it all for a little more. Or that a lot of people below the poverty line work three to four jobs and are always exhausted. This mindset paints wealthy people as hardworking and poor people as lazy. If you're unwilling to put in the work, then poverty will overtake you. A lazy person is described here as a man devoid of understanding. In other words, a lazy person is a fool because they don't understand that their laziness will lead to their poverty. Don't be lazy. Work hard. And it makes it so people seeking help are seen as social pariahs. It's time for all Americans to get off of welfare and get back to work. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. You are going to love it. Now, everybody knows the best welfare program is a good paying job. They really think the mindset is, I hate working, so I'm not going to get a job, but instead I'm going to go on welfare and just sit back and relax. 
I want that welfare, Dennis. We do. So do I. No, you don't understand. I got a taste of my dream. I can't go back. I got to get to Broadway, and welfare is the key. But that's not the real story. That's the narrative conservatives tell themselves. We have the government, and again, I agree, agree with Jamie Dimon, I blame a lot of it on the government, that rewards people for doing nothing. And that's been part of our labor problem here over the last two years to try to get folks coming back to work. And you've heard this, maybe you haven't heard this, but I've definitely heard this. Um, you're right, We in this studio I'm in right now, we have folks that show up at five in the morning, they work very, very hard, and they're all millennials too, you're right. But there is a certain group out there that gets paid 15 bucks an hour from the government to stay home. Still? And then is that, when is they that have the opportunity to take it. I mean, is, well, some of it, yeah. I mean, if you lose your job, you can still claim, right? But then you can, you, they may get offered a job for $17 an hour, and the logic has been so twisted now in some of these folks where they actually will say back to you, well, why would I work 40 hours a week for an extra two bucks an hour when I can get 15 for sitting at home doing nothing? Brad, I want to start with you. So, should California change their welfare policy? They should not. Uh, welfare is to help those who are the neediest of the needy, and not to bring in uh, children to the world they cannot care for, they cannot be responsible for, and the state uh, must uh, care for these children by giving uh, stipends to, to parents who cannot afford to have these children. That last clip was from about seven years ago, and they were discussing a law in California that was known as the Welfare Queen Law, a law that basically penalized women for getting pregnant while on social assistance. You see, the myth of the welfare queen goes back to a uh, known racist Ronald Reagan. Reagan called up President Nixon at the White House. Hello, Mr. President. Hope I didn't get you out of bed. No, I'm <laughs> Their 12-minute chat was captured on President Nixon's White House tapes and was released in full by the National Archives just last month. It includes Governor Reagan using a racist slur to describe a group of African diplomats at the United Nations. Last night, I tell you, to watch that thing on television, I, as I did, yeah. to see those, you know, those African countries, <laughs> damn them, they're still uncomfortable wearing shoes. <laughs> Even though most people who were on social assistance were white, he made it an us versus them and painted it as black people scamming the system. He also propped up this one woman to create a stereotype that people on welfare were living this lavish life and that they need to change the system as a whole. Linda Taylor, and she was identified by the Chicago Tribune in 1974 as a person who had committed welfare fraud while driving fancy cars, including a Cadillac, and very quickly after that, she was given the nickname the Welfare Queen, and it was a nickname and a stereotype that really very quickly blew up. You know, it was a Chicago paper that gave her that nickname, but it's really Ronald Reagan on the campaign trail that makes that phrase such a household idea. He used one con artist to say that everyone on welfare is also a con artist. They said, hey, this person is scamming the welfare system, so therefore welfare is a scam. Which is kind of like saying that that convenience store was robbed, therefore convenience stores are robbers. Oh. No! Apu! Forced dependency and separated welfare recipients from the mainstream of American society. The Family Support Act says to welfare parents, we expect of you what we expect of ourselves and our own loved ones that you will do your share in taking responsibility for your life and for the lives of the children you bring into this world. The institutionalization of ghetto life, where, as Bill Moyers put it in his special on this subject last year, mothers are children, fathers don't count, and the street is the strongest school. And I just think conservatives should have a special interest in this because, as I've mentioned, our original skepticism about the welfare system has been sadly borne out by recent research. We're also coming to understand that our welfare system weakens community values and self-esteem. Yeah, I wonder how that happened. Where did that shame and low self-esteem come from? But people went with it and it became a bipartisan issue. And welfare was restricted and pulled back. And people who needed the help weren't getting the help they needed. 
welfare reform. By the mid 1990s, a drumbeat of media attention had convinced many Americans that people on welfare were either cheats. With wigs and disguises, she conned welfare workers into believing she was 12 different people. Or loafers. Some people on welfare make more money than people that are working. Why should we have to pay for you to sit at home? Watch your soap operas. The number of Americans receiving cash benefits had hit a record 14 million, and Republicans wanted radical change. They create a culture of poverty and a culture of violence which is destructive of the civilization. Because we create this stigma around social programs because we believe that the important thing to do, the non-lazy thing to do, is to pull yourself up by your bootstraps when the fact is that in some way, shape, or form, we all need help in some way, at some point in our lives, and saying that, hey, the way you needed help is different than the way I needed help, so therefore it's bad and it's wrong. We need to end this stigma. And I'm not saying there's no such thing as a welfare queen. I mean, uh, look at this guy. The funds for this project were part of a broader state audit. It found $77 million of federal welfare grant funds meant for the temporary assistance for needy families program in Mississippi were instead used to help fund projects desired by the politically connected and celebrities, including Favre. A former director of Mississippi's welfare agency, John Davis, has now pleaded guilty to federal and state charges that he conspired to misspend tens of millions of those welfare funds meant for the poorest families in what is the poorest state in the U.S. Text messages in a state court filing have shown Davis, Favre, and former Mississippi Governor Phil Bryan and others worked together to help secure millions in state money to build that stadium, which was a pet project of the former Super Bowl champion. And I know, I know what you're saying. Trevor, aren't you excusing laziness? Isn't that what lazy people do, sit around wasting their energy on excuses instead of working? Laziness turns you into a skilled rationalizer. It ruins the mind. The mind is meant to serve your productivity and your usefulness, and he's turning his mind into, the, into a creation of an unreality that justifies his la laziness. Oh, how the mind does that often. Birds, don't discourage the boy. Weaseling out of things is important to learn. It's what separates us from the animals. Except the weasel. Sometimes you need a break, and sometimes the only way to get that break is to make up an excuse. And that's not a criticism of the person making the excuse, it's a criticism of the society that says we can never take a mental health break, or we can never say, I'm just exhausted, or I'm just depressed today. Because we aren't machines and we can't always schedule and we need that time. So instead you call in and say you got food poisoning, or you tell your friends you can't hang out because your grandma's in town. As the lazy man makes up lame excuses. That is one of the signs of laziness, is you come up with even fabricated, exaggerated excuses, reasons why you shouldn't be doing the thing that you should be doing. You know, I love engineers. Engineers are people whose job it is to find solutions to problems, basically to make things work and see how things can actually get done. But the lazy man, his job, he engineers excuses or ways to keep things from getting done, ways to stop work from actually happening in the first place. We might be able to fool our earthly masters with excuses, with lies, but we will never be able to fool our heavenly master. Why? Because God will not be mocked. Why do you talk like that? Why do you talk like you're at a funeral and you want to sound respectful but actually you hated the guy who died? What is your excuse? I'm just not passionate about my work, man. I don't believe in the product. My boss is a jerk. They don't give me enough vacation. They don't pay me enough. I, I think I was made for something different. I mean, complaining about your job is an important part of life, right? Everybody complains about their job. Am I wrong about this? I mean, I love this job. I love it so much. I love it more than any job I've ever had or any job I've ever thought about having. But I also love to complain about the amount of sermons I have to watch because that's the hardest part of my job. So I complain about it because if I don't complain about it, then I'm going to explode. So is there any reason to quit a job? Now, it says doing good 
If you're in a workplace that's requiring you to do evil, get out of it. If you're required to lie, get out of it. There's obvious, there's obvious jobs that if there's sin involved, you need to get out of it. It says working with your hands what is good, not what is evil. We got some young people that are working a whole lot of Sundays, forsaking the assembly of the, of the church. Brethren, that is not good. Quit your job, trust the Lord, find another job, and work with your hands. Don't work, don't, you, there's no place for working with your hands to be able to give if that working with your hands is taking you out of what God commands you to be involved with. That's no good, that's bad. Right, Sunday, the day of rest, so we're all allowed to rest. Let us remember this. In the Bible, there is a Sabbath principle. We were not made to work constantly and never have a rest. No, our bodies need recharging. We need to get sufficient sleep. Why? Because we're not God. We're just made from the dust of the ground. And for us to think that we can keep working is actually an affront against the Most High God. Because we're saying we have the same energy as you when we don't. So let us remember, yes, sleep is a gift from God, but let none of us abuse this precious gift. And if you're abusing it, you know who you are, and you're only doing a disservice to yourself. Because God created man, and he put him in a garden to work. Because when we work, when we find our calling, when we have a purpose, that's actually when we're most happy. Talk to me like a person, you psycho! <laughs> I love these lazy Saturdays. It's Wednesday, Homer. Ah, work! If you aren't working six days, then you can't claim to keep the Sabbath. If you're not working for six days, then what sets the Sabbath apart as a day of rest? By not working six days, you're failing to set apart the Sabbath and therefore breaking the Sabbath commandment. Let me say it again. If you don't work six days, then you're not keeping the Sabbath. It comes to Sabbath. Notice when God lays down the principle of Sabbath, it's one day, not two days, right? He says, you're gonna lay up aside the seventh day. So I love it because it's a critique on workaholics and it's a critique on lazy people. It's a critique on workaholics because it said, hey, by the way, stop and rest for one day. But it's a critique on, on lazy people because it says, you don't get two days off, you don't get four days off. Work the field. Do your thing. This is what God has called us to do. It's uh, pretty ironic that people who talk for a living are telling hardworking people that they are lazy for taking two days off in a week. And I should know. I, I talk for a living. Honestly, these people should be embarrassed. You have a platform where you can encourage people and you can give people real practical and helpful advice, but instead you shame them for having a weekend? The plant called and said, if you don't come in tomorrow, don't bother coming in Monday. Woohoo! Four-day weekend! But at least we get to retire when we're older, right? Retirement belongs to the thinking of the world, folks, not to the Word of God. In my Bible, I read this in Revelation 14, 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, Blessed are the dead, not the retired, the dead, who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. You see, brethren, we rest from our labors when we die, not when we retire. There's nothing about retirement in the Bibles. You're not going to find it there. Brethren, we need to work while it's day. The night is coming when no man can work. We need to work as long as we've got strength, as long as we've got life. We need to do what we can. We need to follow Christ to the end. Retirement is simply trying to make your heaven here. The Bible says don't store up for retirement. Store up treasure in heaven. That is where we retire. That is where the eternal rest is. <laughs> Take that, old people. I just hate the idea of wasting time. I always have. Ever since what happened to my neighbor in St. Olaf. Rose. <laughs> Are you about to educate us on the evils of wasting time by telling a long, tedious St. Olaf story? <laughs> Do you know a better way? <laughs> Uh, in Genesis 3, man chose a way that was different than what God had for him. Sin entered the world. And then it talks about the result of that sin. And one of the specified results is now you will work and it will be hard. Now you're going to work the ground and it's going to fight against you. A, a result of sin. He, here's, what that, here's the truth about work. Work is supposed to be hard. I don't believe that we are supposed to live our lives as if our life is a punishment. 
I'm not saying you should quit any job as soon as you have a bad day, but I'm saying it's okay to look for a better job. It's okay to find a place where you are happy, kind of like this pastor did, I assume. It's okay to live the one life we have, not believing that we are supposed to live it as a punishment because some dude a long time ago ate some fruit. Today, in the fallen world that we live in, work is hard. That's the truth. You know what's interesting about Genesis and work? Work shows up in Genesis 1 when God created man. And he says, hey, I want you to work the ground and subdue it. That's hard work. That's shovel in hand, digging holes, digging ditches kind of work. It's difficult work. But the reality of that being in Genesis 1 is it's before Genesis 3. When God created a perfect world, there was work. Work is not the result of the fall. In fact, you and I will work in heaven. That's the truth. We will have jobs in heaven. And so work is good. Work is hard because of sin. Not because you have the wrong job. Not because you're doing the wrong thing. It's hard because of sin. Do do we have to go to Heaven University to get a job we like in Heaven? Or is it like a sign based on the jobs we had here on Earth? Am I going to be a barista in Heaven? Oh, I'm not going to Heaven, am I? What? Do I ever read the comments? I'm going straight to hell. What am I talking about? We're saying we don't get to choose our circumstances. We don't get to change our circumstances. But we can choose our response, our attitudes to the circumstances of life. And one circumstance that we all in this room share together is this. God has given each one of us a limited amount of time, talents, resources, and opportunities, but we choose how we spend those gifts from God. Do we choose how to spend that time, or do we have to have jobs that we hate? One choice of an attitude is an attitude of productivity. I've defined that on your outline as being an attitude that maximizes, that chooses to maximize God's gifts to us. Or we can choose the attitude of laziness. Laziness, the Bible calls it slothfulness. It is an attitude of indifference toward the time, the talent, the resources, and the opportunities that God gives us. Right, and that's it. It's all about productivity. What value are you adding to the world? How are you a commodity that can be traded? Calcify calcium ducts? Well, give me a Y. Give me a... Hey, all I have to type is Y. Hey, miss doesn't find me attractive sexually anymore. I just tripled my productivity. How are you being a cog in the capitalist machine? Oh my God, that guy who always comments that I'm a communist is going to love this video. How am I not realizing that till now? Buddy, I I don't know what to say. I'm not a communist. I, I don't think. That's not my point. Anyways, back to it. My Homer is not a communist. He may be a liar, a pig, an idiot, a communist, but he is not a porn star. But here's the thing. For centuries, people have claimed that lazy people are bad, lazy people ruin society, lazy people are useless. But what if laziness isn't even a real thing? What are you talking about, Trevor? I know lazy people. Hell, I'm lazy sometimes. I mean, like I pointed out, sometimes what we call laziness is just someone needing a break. And sometimes what we call laziness is really just a symptom of a mental health issue. Now, sometimes it's very outward. Uh, One of the earliest uh, heartbreaks I had as a pastor is when I got a phone call from a couple that said that that, uh, child protection had just taken their daughter from them and they weren't going to give her back until they accomplished something, cleaned their house. Uh, And then I, Pam and I ended up going over and seeing their house it was devastating. And, and you know what I want to say? Child protection did the right thing to take the little girl out. Uh, but a lot of times we're not aware of how often children are taken from homes because of a sin called sloth. Like I said earlier, I used to work for a garbage removal company. And one thing that we dealt with on numerous occasions was a hoarding situation. One thing was always clear. This was not somebody being lazy This was a mental health issue. 
I had people crying and apologizing for what our employees would have to see when they got there. And I reassured them that they are okay. We've seen everything, and they are taking a huge step in calling us. I would never, ever consider shaming them or imply that they're lazy, not just because I wanted to make the sale, not just because we needed the business, but because that is not what it was. People get depressed. There are obsessive issues. There are so many different reasons besides sloth. Dismissing it as a sin called sloth instead of having compassion is super problematic. Oh my lord! Stupid babies need the most attention. Um, theologians all through history have seen sloth closely connected with self-pity, which is not what we would think of right off the bat, which is fascinating because that's actually what self-pity is. Uh, Thomas Aquinas defines sloth as sorrow about spiritual good and as sluggishness of the mind which neglects to begin good. It is evil in its effect if it so oppresses man as to draw him away entirely from good deeds. It goes so far as to refuse the joy that comes from God and to be repelled by divine goodness. Like that's like mic drop quote, so good. And that is literally what this is all about. And so um, when we're called to virtue, right? The slothful person reacts with sadness or drags himself toward. If God goes, I want you to do this. I want you to love neighbor. I want you to love me. I want you to love your city. I want you to love your church. I want you to whatever. What is a slothful person? They just drag themselves toward it, right? They do everything with reluctance, assuming they do anything at all. There's no joy in doing God's will. Living a spiritual and loving life is a burden to this person. And soon, they will give up on the necessary tasks to lead a virtuous life. This type of lifestyle is devoid of love for God and neighbor. And in the end, focuses on the self. (laughs) He straight up acknowledges that it's depression and still shames people for it. When we create the stigma and shame, we make it worse. People hide what they are going through and they don't seek help. The sluggard's motto is never do today what you can postpone till tomorrow. That's his whole life credo. He's always finding a reason to procrastinate work that needs to be done. I struggle with procrastination. I recently (laughs) tweeted that uh, the worst part about being self-employed is when you have a procrastinator as an employee. And that's true. My anxiety is a big factor when it comes to procrastination because if I can put something off until tomorrow, then I can just disappoint myself tomorrow. And then there's the ADHD of it all. Daydream, procrastinate, sit and waste time watching TV. We waste hours a day literally scrolling nonsense on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. Is any of these sins more relevant to our lives right now? And so we start things that we never actually finish. We end up neglecting God or people because of our laziness. There is nothing that will kill your spiritual or social life more than that. That, that what? We say this all the time, that thing in your pocket, the, the, the phone, See, this is what the devil uses, absolute distraction. See, we talk a lot about things that the devil would use to kill you. One of the major ones, distraction. Sitting, scrolling, being a non-contributing zero. Maybe that's why the Bible takes sloth so seriously. So some people get distracted easily. Again, this isn't laziness. This is how their brain works. And it's definitely not a sin issue. My feet in my personal life and in growth, I think that because I love being comfortable, it's comfortable for me to work and do the things that I enjoy. It's very hard if I know I'm not good at something to go after and do it. If I'm not good at it, it's hands off. And I think that you've seen that. I will self-report I'm not good at something, and so I just I don't want any part in it versus doing the work needed to become good at it. Mm. And so I've hindered myself a lot in that um, and stunted my growth a lot personally in things that I just hands off. If it's not a natural uh, giftingness, then I won't go after it. 
I'm not a doctor, I'm no expert, so I won't pretend to know her reasons for it, but I will say that I know a lot of people who have ADHD, and giving up because they aren't perfect right away is something that I have seen a lot. And this ties in with hyperfixation or hyperfocus. It's, it's when people with ADHD get it in their head that they want to do something. So they buy all the best equipment they can afford, they read all the books, they watch all the tutorials, they think about how this will affect their future and how this will be their new passion and eventually their new career. And, and they get so excited and it's all they can talk about to all their friends and they're so excited about this new part of their life. And then they get started. And it isn't perfect right away. So they give up. And they start focusing on something else. Is you know, do you do jobs 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent and not all the way? You need to be a finisher, not just a starter in life. Laziness is the guy that has a lot of projects that are never completed. Now, this might hit home for some people, but that's kind of the point. Maybe you should actually walk around your home and ask yourself, do I have all these little projects I keep starting, but none of them get finished because there's a lion in the streets. You know, I've got really good excuses for them. In fact, think of this scripture from Ecclesiastes when you have excuses not to do the projects around your home. It says, because of laziness, the building decays and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. Man, this is 3,000-year-old wisdom. So whether it's a project around your house or if it's some sort of venture you're doing for whatever other purpose, not some selfish ambition, but just a good thing you started, go finish it. Stay committed. True or not? Yeah, Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, you know, being with students for the better part of, gosh, whether volunteering and being in the ministry full-time for, you know, 17, 18 years, you've you've had a lot of, I've had a lot of parents come to me and say, my kid will not respond to anything. They're just, they're lazy. They don't want to do anything. And, um, and I think what I've noticed is that uh, what it requires is, first of all, the, a, a basic need for any human being is they, they want to be known. They want to be known by somebody and someone that's willing to take that time. Um, and I think parents do, um, but oftentimes it takes another voice. And so what I've seen is a lot of times it, it requires, uh, in my interactions, I need to figure out what makes them tick. Like, what is the thing that drives them? And so one of my top five strength finders is adaptability. And so I can meet somebody and I almost at an instant want to know what are the things that you enjoy because I'm a natural learner. I want to learn about things that maybe I'm not necessarily good at, but what it does is it it almost livens them up. And so you find the thing that excites them and you know working with junior hires and high schoolers for such a long time like sloth like feels like it runs rampant um and almost gets sort of you know it's it's almost almost like a stereotype like oh lazy 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 kids lazy students um but but i think a lot of times it requires um to to really to really find out and know know them for who they are and find out what makes them tick who they are is teenagers and teenagers need more sleep. It's as simple as that. Their bodies are changing a lot, they are becoming adults, and we make them get up at six or seven in the morning. Their gunsta needs some naps. It's not a failure. It's not a sin. It's biology. But what do I know? I live in a world where everything is too easy and too convenient. It's, it's to the point of technology is helping us do nothing. That's the point of it. I'm, everything gets automated, which means you don't have to do anything. And so sloth in our culture isn't a vice. It's, 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 it's what we get marketed to. It's, it's, it's like, here's the great product. I'm gonna pitch to you right now. Buy this product and you won't have to do this thing anymore. This thing will do it for you and it's great. It's like, make me coffee, awesome. Warm my food, awesome. Good stuff, save time, love that. As a guy in a hurry but all of it is embraced because we think it's gonna give us more free time as if that's the greatest good. And I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure the last 20 years has taught us that it's true because it just frees us up to what? To add stuff. See, what do we do if there's margin? We just fill it. We don't just sit around and breathe and think and we never stop to ask ourselves, Is that always the greatest good? This isn't a new idea. People have always said this about modern technology. I don't know. Maybe part of it's the fact that you're in a hurry. You've grown up on instant orange juice. 
Flip a dial, instant entertainment. Dial seven digits, instant communication. Turn a key, push a pedal, instant transportation. Flash a card, instant money. Shove in a problem, push a few buttons, instant answers. But some problems you can't get quick answers to no matter how much you want them. Man, I see kids everywhere with those stick hoops lately. No, me too. It's gotta be bad for their brains, right? Yeah, it, it stunts their attention span. I read an article in the paper. Yeah, I saw that. It's like they lose the power to innovate because they're staring at the stick hoop all day. Yep. The cure for laziness is discipline despite difficulty. You can write that down. The cure for laziness is discipline despite difficulty. Proverbs 6 says this, go to the ant, you sluggard, L lazy person, look at the ant. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. Your Highness, I can't count when you hover like that. Oh, of course, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. It doesn't know, it doesn't know or, or care or think about, hey, is this hard? It says, hey, this has to be done, so I'll do it. And you know we aren't ants, right? What is this? A center for ants! Who is the most hard-working man that has ever lived? Jesus. Jesus, yeah, Jesus. The Bible says, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So who's the hardest working man that ever lived? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's tricky like that, Jesus. So let us pray. He was always about his father's business. He was always working hard. There was points when he was so busy that he was too busy that he couldn't eat. The reason these people can talk into a mic and put their image all over the internet to talk about laziness is because of human innovation. They probably drive places instead of walk. They probably use washing machines instead of scrubbing their clothes by hand. They probably order food delivery sometimes. And most likely... They never have to dig a well or walk down to the river to get water. Human innovation has come out of the desire to find shortcuts, to figure out an easier way to do things. And these people have all benefited from that. All this is is people in places of privilege shaming people and encouraging others to shame people for something that has benefited mankind for centuries. So-called laziness is the mother of invention. Now, here's my everything's okay alarm. This will sound every three seconds unless something isn't okay. All this to say, it's okay to take breaks. It's okay to make excuses if you need to. It's okay to find a career you enjoy doing. It's okay not to be defined by your career. It's okay to fight for change so that you and others can be happy and not abuse at your jobs. And it's okay to ask for help when you need to. You're not lazy. You're not sinning when you play a video game. Unless you pirated it. Hey everybody, thank you so much for making it this far. Um, if you know somebody who may benefit from this, send it their way. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Uh, thanks. Work, 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 Sky Moon. <laughs>